with what we are understanding from God's Word. We find ourselves at a place today where we can dig deeply into truths around God's work within us. I've changed the word on the cross from Savior to saved because over the next week, over the next weeks, the next four weeks today, and the next three, we're going to be talking about what it means to be saved. God's work within us to bring us to himself, to make us his very own. And so as we hear from God's word, I want us to consider, this is a big book. This is called, the, this, this Bible is called the Gospel for America. The text of scripture was taken around to different places all around the United States, and, and people hand wrote out the scripture. And then a copy of that was made. The Levermans, a couple in our roots group, gave this to the orchard. Now, I'll have it here afterwards if you want to come and see it. The story is told about how this Bible was put together. But the question becomes, is there a chapter in this big book where I could turn and, and I could get a, not only a, a, you know, a 30,000 foot view of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, but also one that goes into the very depths of my heart to understand what it is to be saved by God, to be saved by Jesus. Well, we're to that chapter in the book of Romans, Romans chapter eight. Now it's not exhaustive and it doesn't tell us everything there is about following Jesus, but it is a great chapter to know and to understand. So in our journey through Romans, we're gonna, we're gonna slow down the pace and walk through Romans chapter eight over a four weeks time using this acrostic, saved, as a helpful way of us understanding God's saving work for us. So would you stand with me, please? I'm gonna ask you to begin by saying this, this portion of scripture with me. This is the message of faith that we proclaim. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with a heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with a mouth, resulting in salvation. Now, I'll continue to read from Romans chapter 8. We've heard it already. Ryan recited it. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, because the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, since it was weakened by the flesh... God did. He condemned sin in the flesh by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering. In order that the law's requirements would be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit have their minds set on the things of the spirit. Now the mindset of the flesh is death. But the mindset of the spirit is life and peace. The mindset of the flesh is hostile to God because it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it is unable to do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you. If anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Now, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his Spirit who lives in you. Pray with me, please. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts May they be acceptable in your sight, Lord Jesus, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Almost 50 years ago at a Young Life property, Young Life is a Christian ministry for students in high school primarily, at, at that retreat center, sharing a dinner, just myself and another man at this table, i had been hearing about Jesus. I've been attending a church, Faith Presbyterian Church in Aurora, Colorado. 
I began, under, began understanding a bit of what it meant to follow Jesus. God's work by his spirit within me had brought me out of the whole funnel of all the different ways that God had made himself known to me. It was narrowing down, narrowing down, narrowing down. And I had questions. I wanted questions to be answered. The guy that was there with me at the table is a man by the name of Dave Pinkerton. I don't sure he might be related to the Pinkertons of Derry, but Dave Pinkerton sat there and answered questions for me. And as, it was as though my eyes were opened, my heart was made ready to hear what he shared with me. And that was the bottom line question for me is, okay, Dave, how do I step through the door? How do I become, as you describe it, a Christian? How, how do I become a follower of Jesus? He read for me, recited for me, these words we have heard. This is the message of faith that we proclaim. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness. One confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. And Dave shared that with me. It wasn't more than about uh, 30 or 40 minutes later, I sat and prayed a very simple prayer. Jesus, I don't understand everything about you, but I understand this about me. I need you. I need you. I need you to save me. That confession of faith that I made that night, although it wasn't precisely these three words, it was an expression of my heart. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus, be my Lord. Now, for the first readers, the first hearers of the book of Romans, that expression, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, carried a weight I don't think we can fully understand. Because for those followers of Jesus, both Jews and Gentiles living there in Rome, to say Jesus is Lord was in direct conflict with a message proclaimed by the Roman citizens throughout the entire empire. And that message is this. Caesar is Lord. To say Jesus is Lord means that I'm aligning myself with the teachings, the person, the power of this carpenter from Nazareth, whose message, whose life, whose story had found its way from Jerusalem all the way to Rome. Now they're saying Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. Rome is not the kingdom. The kingdom of Jesus is the one that I follow after. So they confessed with their mouths and said, Jesus is Lord. They aligned themselves with Jesus and they believed in their hearts that he had been raised to life. We look back now and see through the ministry of the early church, the wildfire that the message of the resurrection brought to the ancient world. The message of Jesus' resurrection spread like wildfire out of Jerusalem to Judea, to Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And that simple and yet profound message that Christ had conquered death, that he had been raised to life, not only was a wildfire, it, it was the fuel that motivated the people of God to continue to talk about it. So much so that eventually, in the life of the followers of Jesus living in Rome, there was an edict that was passed. All right, Christians, stop talking about these two things. Jesus is not your Lord, and stop talking about him being raised to life. Because they were determined they were going to tell people about Jesus. Through the message they communicated, many people were coming to faith in Christ. And Paul understands within the church there in Rome, there's struggle within the church. We're going to touch on that today. But I'm going to invite you, whether you are a seasoned saint who's been walking with Jesus for a long time, or you're a seeker, someone here who is just kind of asking questions about what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus. I'm going to encourage us 
to be people over these next three weeks, today and the following, to understand what it means that Jesus has saved you. So let's look at this now. To be saved. You know me, I like my acrostics. I think they're a good way for us to take away the teaching. I'm going to ask, ask you to say these words with me. To be saved is to be spirit-filled, adopted, victorious, empowered, destined. Today we talk about what it means to be spirit-filled. And it's appropriate that we do it on this day because this day is Pentecost Sunday, as well as Sunday for Unreached People Groups. I think they probably figured that out because Pentecost... The coming of the Spirit of God upon those first followers of Jesus was to take the message to the ends of the earth. Jesus had told them, wait in Jerusalem, hang out in Jerusalem, and when the Spirit of God comes upon you, you are to take the message that he is Lord, that he is raised to life. You are to take it to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So Pentecost Sunday, a Jewish festival celebrated even by us as followers of Jesus, Pentecost came 50 days after Passover. So 50 days, seven weeks after Easter, we celebrate Pentecost. Here's how it was described by the gospel writer Luke in Luke or in Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were staying. They saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and rested on each one of them. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them. That coming of the Holy Spirit upon the church, upon the followers of Jesus, for the first time was different than what Samuel did with David. When Samuel anointed David, he set him aside as the king. When the Spirit of God came upon the people of God, it wasn't just upon one. It was upon all of them. All of them filled with his Spirit. All of them receiving the very person of God in the Spirit of God coming upon them. Now, the story in Acts chapter 2 is one that almost always Causes people to kind of go, whoa, 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 wait a second. What about this? What about that? They start talking in a language that is not their own. They start speaking in tongues that are not their own. They start talking in languages that are not their own. There are so many different ways that God is demonstrating to his people there what he wants them to be about. But let's look at this for a moment. In Genesis chapter 11, All the way back here at the start of this big book. The people then, in rebellion against God, said, let's build a tower. Let's build a tower and it'll reach up to the heavens. And we can climb the tower and get up to heaven. It's called the Tower of Babel or the Tower of Babylon. And so they decide to start building this tower. God says, no, 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 no. Enough of that. He came and confused their language. So now instead of understanding what they're doing, they got a huge language barrier. They're talking to each other, but they don't understand each other. And long before there was Google Translate, God said, if my people filled with my spirit are going to take this message to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, I will give them the capacity to speak in a language that is not their own. In fact, on the day of Pentecost, when the disciples, the sound of the rushing wind and the voices being spoken in languages that were not their own, there's a crowd that has gathered and Jews who come from all around the known world at that time. And they're hearing the story of Jesus, that he is Lord, that he's been raised to life. They're hearing the story of Jesus spoken in their own language. God reversed the curse of the Tower of Babel at Pentecost. They began to speak the story. That evidence of being filled by the Spirit was certainly one. 
that formed the church. Just a little touch point about Luke's description there. The tongues of fire, the rushing wind. These are images from their Jewish Bible about the dedication of the temple, 2 Chronicles chapter 7. The fire from heaven fell into the temple that the people of God had made. Genesis chapter 1, the rushing wind, the very breath of God being breathed over the world that was chaotic and empty. And God, by his breath, by the rush of his wind, by the Spirit, brought order and filled the earth. So what are the benefits? What are the benefits of being Spirit-filled? Paul describes it this way. You are set free. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, because the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Going back to last week when we talked about the wretched man of Romans chapter 7, the person who has tried to live the law but cannot, the person under the, under the good influence of the law has thought, this is how I'm going to live, but then they find themselves unable to do it. Paul now says there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus because the law of the spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and death. And God has done and accomplished through Jesus what we could not do for ourselves. The wrestling of the wretched man is done because of what Christ has accomplished. No condemnation. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death because God what God did in Jesus, the law's requirement for us to be a reflection of the very character of God, for us to be as his people, the ones who live out his life to show his glory to the world around us. That that law had been fulfilled in us. We do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And we're set free to be people who now have a new mindset. Listen to this. For those who live, in the, live according to the flesh have their mindset on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on the things of the Spirit. Now the mindset of the flesh is death. The mindset of the Spirit is life and peace. Let's define a couple of terms there. First one being the flesh. This is a word that Paul uses not exclusively throughout his writings, but certainly in Romans chapter 8, he is using it to describe the present corruptible, decaying world and the humans who are a part of that, apart from Jesus, apart from his saving, spirit filling work. He, he's talking about a realm, he's talking about a a place where people are contrary to the very heart of God. And he says, that's the flesh. But he says in that place, the end of that flesh is death. The spirit, so, so different than that. The spirit, the person of God, the very person of God, Father, Son, and Spirit, the very person of God who fills and inhabits those who are saved by Jesus. The spirit who filled the first followers of Jesus at Pentecost fills us today, and he gives to us a mindset, a way of looking at our life, a way of looking at the world around us and understanding that our, our walk with God is to bring about life and peace. This mindset that we have as followers of Jesus, this mindset, I ask you the question, what do you give yourself to? Now, what arouses you to begin the day? Now, what motivates you to step through the door? What, what, what pushes you towards loving another person? What's your mindset? Ask the Spirit. Ask the Spirit to show you what is my mindset? Because that work of the Spirit within us is a benefit for our life, this life, and the life to come. Let's go through this. The certainty of life is another benefit of being filled with the Spirit. Being saved by Jesus, being Spirit-filled by Jesus, following in His footsteps, His accomplishments. He was raised to life. We will be raised to life. 
And it is a benefit for us even in this life right now. Christian author N.T. Wright writes, Paul is talking about the remarkable phenomenon at the heart of the Christian experience. A new life, a new energy bubbling up inside us, leading us to praise, urging us to prayer, warning us against complacency for sin, nudging us to acts of love and gentleness, providing fresh glimpses of previously unimagined wisdom and illumination, leading us to places and tasks that might seem crazy, but might just be our true vocation. That's the Spirit of God within us. And where we most live out our lives to the very pleasure of God. That the Father is pleased with us. Not a works mentality, but a reflection of the work within us that the Spirit brings about that we live out the life of Jesus. So, let's finish with this. How do we become Spirit-filled? Beginning at Pentecost, the Spirit of God came upon the people. We've heard some of the benefits, and certainly what I've said today does not limit us to what the Spirit brings to us. But we are set free. We have a new mindset. We have a certainty of life then and now. How do you become Spirit-filled? Drink and pray. Drink and pray. I take this from an article written by John Piper. Drink. Take something from outside of your body into your body for its sustaining capacity. In fact, it's interesting within Scripture, there's a contrast taken between taking alcohol into our body or taking the spirit into our body. Each of them come from the outside. Each of them have a profound influence upon how we look at life. So he says, he says don't get drunk. He says, be filled with the spirit. And, and Jesus himself said it this way. Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scripture has said, will have streams of living water flow from deep within him. He said this about the Spirit. Those who believed in Jesus were going to receive the Spirit, for the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus has not yet been glorified. Now we're beyond that. Jesus has been raised to life. He has been glorified, and he poured out his Spirit over his disciples. They drank deeply of him. So what are you thirsting for in life? Is it, be, is it to be filled by the Spirit? To drink deeply of the life of Jesus? To be filled with the Spirit is, I believe, both normative, descriptive, and prescriptive for us as followers of Jesus, because there's no substitute for the spirit-filled life. No season of that was then, and this is now. He says, drink, be thirsty for the spirit, and then pray, he says. Jesus is speaking in Luke chapter 11 when he says this, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will a heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who seek him? Jesus is the fountain of the spirit. The father is the giver of the spirit. And he says, says to us, you, you do your best to care for your kids, even though you don't always have the best of motives. My father has a pure motive to pour out his spirit into you and over you. But you have to ask. You have to ask. So being empty of the spirit, the father will fill you. Will it be as dramatic as Pentecost when the people there Heard the rushing wind and the flames of fire? Perhaps. I don't know. That's up to God. But I do know this, that it is part of being saved by Jesus. Without question. Read through this big book and you come to this conclusion. The work of God is to fill the people of God with the Spirit of God because Jesus has made us acceptable, right, righteous before God the Father. He's brought us into the family. We're going to learn about that next week, what it means to be adopted by God. We are to be people filled with the Spirit. So I'm going to encourage you, as I have done this day and other days, 
But today in particular, I want you to pray this prayer with me. I want to be Spirit-filled. Could you say that with me? I want to be Spirit-filled. And, and let the sincerity of that prayer circle back throughout your day. That I want to be Spirit-filled. It is the first quality for what it is for us to be saved by Jesus. Pray with me, please. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks that you have accomplished for us what we cannot accomplish for ourselves. And having done that, you have made us people of God to be filled with the Spirit of God. And so on this Pentecost Sunday, Lord, we remember how you began the church. Let us be a people filled with your Spirit. Lord, I'll leave the giving of the Spirit up to you because you are the source of it, not me. But I do ask, Lord, that for each and every one of us, we would understand today that being saved by Jesus means I am filled with his Spirit. And Jesus, we pray these things in your name. Amen? Amen, amen.